Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. My daughter, she's seven years old, and um, she has this incredible ability to constantly up the ante on anything I offered her. So it's this amazing skill she has. I'll come up with something really cool to give to my daughter. I'll be like, Elise, guess what? I'm going to take you to Chick-fil-A. And without missing a beat, she will go, that's amazing, Dad. And then we can go out for ice cream. And then you can take me to Hobby Lobby and buy me craft supplies. And then we can go down to the Riverland paddleboard. And then you can let me stay up really late and watch TV. And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> Slow down. No, I'm like, it, it wears me out, man. Because I'm like, this kid, like, she's always wants just a little bit more. And I'm like, it wears me out because I'm like, I'm thinking I'm giving her something great. And she just ups the ante like, yeah, plus this and that. And, 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 and part of that's just, she's like her mom, unfortunately. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> her mom can always up the ante, right? But it's like, it's just, and I asked Emily about it one time. I'm like, what's the deal? Why can't she be happy with what I'm offering her? And she's like, oh, she's very happy with what you're offering her. But it gets her mind going on what more there could be for her. Yeah. I started thinking about kids. You know, kids are like that. They're just like, more, more. I just want to soak up life. You know, we're like. Just stay in bed for a little longer in the morning, for God's sake. But they're up, and they are going. If you've got young kids, if you don't have young kids anymore, you remember what that was like? And you're just like, I'm glad those days are over, right? The kids are just go, soak up the day. And I think there's something in us innately as kids that that says, man, we want more, 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 more. But somewhere along the way, life happens. And maybe you get disappointed or you get hurt. And then all of a sudden, you start to go, well, maybe I just need to protect what I've got. Maybe... Maybe there isn't more out there. Maybe there's not something better. Maybe I just need to pr- protect it. But I'm convinced that that desire for more is something God put in us. And I've, I've, I've talked to people from all walks of life, all over the world, and I hear this from them. I, I hear all of them say, man, I know there's more in me than this. I've talked to CEOs at the top of their game, guys that own multiple businesses. You look at them, they are the epitome of success. They're just at the top. And when I talk to them in coaching, they'll tell me, man, I really am happy with my life. I've got a great life, great job, great family, but I know there's more in me than this. There's more in me that that I can accomplish than this. I've talked to people who have hit rock bottom, and every time they shoot up or snort up or whatever it is, ingest that substance, the addiction's taking them down, they say every time they take it, they go, man, I know I'm better than this, but the pain is so deep that they're like, I just can't handle the pain. I've got to numb it but they know every time there's something more in them. And, and I believe that, that thing within you that says, man, I, I know there's more in me than this. Either I'm better than this or I know I've got more to give. I believe that is a holy discontentment that God has put in you. There's this verse in 2 Corinthians where the apostle Paul, he says this. He says, if we're out of our mind, it's because Christ's love compels us. And that word compels is a really weird word. It's this Greek word that if you look at it, like the way they translate it in the New International Version, it says God's love constrains us which compels and constrains are total opposites, right? You'd think like constrain means holds me back, compels means push, push me forward. What is it? Well, if you look at the word, it, it has this sense of God's love coming, wrapping his hands around you, and then squeezing you like a toothpaste tube. And if you've ever felt that, like, I know there's more, shouldn't I be just content with what I've got? But you're like, I know there's more in me to give. I know God's calling me to do something more. That's that love of God within you that's pushing you outward, that suneku. He's squeezing you like a toothpaste bottle. He says, man, I love you just as you are, and there's way more in you than that. And it can be uncomfortable sometimes. Because sometimes you're like, man, God, am I ever going to achieve those things? And sometimes you hit a wall, and you face some disappointment. You hit a setback, relational challenge, and marital challenge, financial challenge, and you go, Am I ever going to receive it? And some of you are looking at your life right now and going, man, I thought I'd be way further along in my life than I am right now. And you're so disappointed. Some of you thought, man, I thought I'd be married still by now. But man, the divorce was finalized in December. And here I am, a single person again. Some of you thought, man, this is it. We're set now. Everything's going to be good. And then everything last year tanked and crumbled. And you're going, wow, I'm starting from scratch again. I thought I'd be further along here. But you know there's something in you. So we're going to talk over the next few weeks about how God has more for you. And that desire for more, that discontentment you feel, that's not ungodly. It's actually something God put in you. But it's a desire not for more of the things maybe that you're striving for. It's a desire for faith, a greater faith within you. So today I want to specifically talk about there is more for your faith than what you currently have. And faith is a tricky word. Throughout my life, I've been hanging out in the church for 40, 45 years, and I hear people throw the word faith around. Well, I've got faith. I'm going to get through this. And I've always been like, what, what exactly is faith? And this was the Sunday school answer. 
Well, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So they would tell me, faith is being certain. And I have a problem with that definition of faith. Because I don't know about you, but the times when I need the most faith are when I seem to have the least certainty. You don't need faith when it's sunshine and unicorns plant, prancing through the sky. You need faith when it gets really, really dark. And you're going, is this thing I believe really true? Is this for real? You really only need faith when it seems like faith isn't working. And you have to hold on to faith. You have to hold on to the belief that what you believe is true, even when it doesn't seem true. So I'm not so sure that faith is certainty. I'd like it to be certainty. I would love to be certain about everything. Well, then there's other people that say, well, faith, so also, this is the other famous verse in James, right? It says, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. This is a faith without works is dead, meaning faith is action. Faith, you know you've got faith when you step out and make, do, and have, and uh, act on what you believe. That's what faith is. I'm like, but that still doesn't define what faith is. So I've been wrestling with this for the last few months. Ever since I got that melanoma diagnosis, I started going, what do I really believe about like faith and healing and what, who God is and the church and everything? Like, what do I really believe? Which is ridiculous because I've been doing this for 45 years, but here I am like finally asking, what is faith? But sometimes we take for granted what faith is. So here's what I've landed on, and you may completely disagree with me, and that's cool if you do. I may disagree with myself later. Um, <laughs> if you guys haven't figured it out, I do not have it all figured out. You guys listen to me long enough, you're like, that guy is a, a hot mess. I am a hot mess, but I'm, I'm working it through with all of you, okay? So I've landed on this. I'm working on this book right now. This is my new book for the year. I try and write a book every year. My conclusion is this. Faith is increasing spiritual awareness. Now, it's not what you see, it's how you see it. It's increasing spiritual awareness that leads to transformation of how you see God, yourself, and the world. Now, I don't think that's the complete essence of what faith is, but I think that really helps me understand what faith is because if you haven't noticed, faith unveils itself in layers. You know, the truth is a huge, huge thing. The truth is so big that when Jesus was on earth, he told the disciples, he said, guys, I have a lot more truth I want to show you, but you basically can't handle it right now. That's my rough translation of it. He says, you can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson, right? He says, but I'm going to do something. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to guide you in the truth you need at the time you need it. So he's like, you don't even need to worry about like when you're going to face off with difficult challenges. The Holy Spirit will give you the truth you need in that moment if you'll seek him. Because the truth is a very big concept. And at any given moment, all we ever have is partial truth. The Apostle Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. But when we see him, we'll actually see clearly. So for now, we're all kind of stumbling around in the dark, trying to figure out, like, how do I navigate this situation? And what am I supposed to do here, Jesus? And what do I do here? And faith, it, it, it's, this, it's this thing that kind of, it, it unveils itself in layers. And we have to get really comfortable with recognizing that at any given, any given point, there's more to our faith than what we have now. And God uses two specific things that I'm going to talk about in a second to move our faith to the next level, and I only like one of them. The other one I don't like. But we're going to talk about that in a second. But there's this verse where, uh, where I'm basically my essence, my conclusion on faith is this. It's not faith if it doesn't stretch you and drive you to search for more. Faith is uncomfortable. If you're ever comfortable in your faith, I'd say you're not actually having faith in God. You have faith in a God you created in your own image. Because real faith is very uncomfortable. Because as you get increasing awareness of who God is and who you are, you go, ooh, I don't like that. And you have to kind of like the layers of an onion and you're cutting through it, it kind of burns your eyes and you're like, Ugh. you cut through a little bit more and your eyes get used to it and then you cut through another layer and you're like, that's life right there. It's increasing awareness of truth and the truth will set you free, but it tends to make you uncomfortable in the process. It's not faith if it doesn't stretch you and drive you to search for more. So faith is a constant journey of more and more awareness of who God is, who you are, and your interaction with him and the world around you. And it, it leads to action and transformation. So there's this verse that I love. It's in 2 Peter. I've been studying this verse for the last few months, and it's been really kind of blowing my mind what Peter says. Remember, this is Peter, impetuous Peter, who's like lopping off people's ears and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. The only guy who had the dubious distinction of having Jesus say, call him Satan. Remember, he's like, get behind me, Satan. Like, can you imagine if Jesus told you, get behind me, Satan? That would sting. You need some counseling after that, right? He... This is Peter, but this is Peter later in life. He's matured. He's grown in his faith. And he says this. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement or add to your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. 
and self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness, the word, another word is, is endurance. The translated, the English Standard Version says endurance. I actually like that word a lot, endurance. With godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. And you go, well, that's wonderful. That's a whole nice laundry list of random things. It's not random. I'm convinced that is a picture of the sequence of our growth of faith in our life. And I'm wrestling with this. Again, this is, this is a concept I'm working on, so don't hold me to this. I might change my mind later. But I'm kind of convinced that what it looks like, you know, I think of everything in terms of climbing mountains because that's what I love to do. I think that the journey to, to this, this love, I think the sequence, you know, the Apostle Paul at one point, he says, the only thing that really matters is faith working itself into love. And if you notice the sequence here, add to your faith, the ultimate goal is love. But there's a journey up a hill that looks something like this. I think the, the first awareness we come to, if faith is spiritual awareness, with faith is this. God exists, and he loves me, and he forgave my sins. Some of you guys have just come to this realization. You're like, wow. And, and the thing you realize is, well, I'm not worthy of that. I've done some bad stuff. And the struggle we face in that first level of awareness is we aren't worthy. And God says, exactly, you're not worthy. That's why I sent Jesus. He makes you worthy. On your best day, you couldn't live up to what I'm asking of you. But you know what? Jesus came and lived the perfect life. You couldn't. And then he offers his righteousness to you. It's, the word is imputes his righteousness to you. He counts it to your credit. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see all the mistakes and blunders you've made. If you've accepted the gift of Jesus and the perfect life he lived, all he sees is Jesus. The word is justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned when he looks at you. And you start to realize, wow, I am unworthy, but Jesus makes me worthy. And in response to that, the step is, well, I need to start living up to, Paul says this, why don't you live up to the standard of what, God's, what Jesus made you already? And so virtue, the, the word translated there is, is moral, moral correctness or moral straightness. So it's getting yourself in line with the right living that God calls us, the, the new standards God calls us to live by. We've been living for ourselves, living reckless. Some of you guys were destroying your lives and you know it. And now you're like, man, I've got to get, I've got to live right. I've got to do it right. And that is the first stage. You've got to get your life in alignment with morality and what, what God calls us to live. That's what the Ten Commandments were. That's the foundation. Live by those commandments. Now, they don't make you worthy. Jesus makes you worthy. But living in those commands takes away a lot of unnecessary suffering in life. Because when you get in line with what Jesus asks you to do in the life that the line God called you to walk, you walk in, in this new level of freedom. But here's the challenge. You don't stay there. Virtue, some people make their whole religious walk, their whole faith about virtue. And they're like, man, I am so righteous. I don't do, I have not done anything bad in 37 days. <laughs> but here's the thing. You can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. And some people get stuck there and they get all self-righteous and they're like, well, I'm so good. And how come God would use that person over there who's doing horrible things? They're horrible. Their family's all screwed up. Why would God use them? And you go, it, it, you got to recognize that it's not the virtue that leads to faith, right? So we can't get stuck there. The next step is knowledge. So if you're, if you're new to the faith, you may be in that virtue stage right now. You're trying to get yourself in alignment and live right. And that's a good thing to do because each of these stages build on each other. You need each of these stages. But the goal is you don't stay at the stage. And some people get stuck at the stage. And I'm going to explain why in a second, why people get stuck. The next step is knowledge. This is where you say, man, it, you should have a hunger for God's word that he places in you. So when you first come to the faith, you start to get yourself in alignment. And then you're like, man, I need to learn more about the Bible. There was a, a young lady that used to come to the church here. She's moved since, but she became a good friend of ours. And she was talking to me one day. I'm like, where, where were you last Sunday? She's like, oh, I went to another church. And I'm like, why'd you go to another church? And she's like, well, I don't know. She's like, I like your teaching, but I need a place that really teaches the Bible. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> I, have you not seen how many Bible verses I use? She's like, no, but I know, but I need some place that really teaches the Bible. I'm like, I'm getting even madder. I'm like, all right, be preacher-like here. What do you mean? And I'm like, I use a freaking Bible? What are you talking about, lady? She's like, no, I need to know, like, who were the Midianites? And what does Baal mean? And I was like, oh, you need, like, you want knowledge about the Bible. And the crazy thing is, so I grew up in the faith. So my whole elementary, middle school, and high school, I was at a Christian school. So I was just pumped full of this stuff. So I knew who the Midianites were, right? All that stuff. And, but you forget once you know something, what it's like to not know it. 
And there's this hunger that when, when you first come to Christ, there's this hunger. I got to know more about this stuff. And that's why Bible studies, like we do a precepts Bible study here with K. Arthur, one of the best small groups if you want to just really dive into like, what is this? What are these things? What does the Babylonian captivity mean? What is you know, all these things in the Bible? You're like, what does that even mean? The history of it. That's what those small groups are for, to dive into that stuff. And it's, if you don't, I mean, the hunger for God's word is, is part of the journey here. And so I had somebody come up to me the other day saying, man, I need to learn more about the Bible. And I'm like, well, apparently you can't count on me. So no, I'm just kidding. But you got to read, you got to read the Bible and you got to get in and, and find Bible studies that'll go deep. But Sunday morning, we don't necessarily do Bible study. That's for smaller groups where you can ask questions and things like that. But you got to do that in a small group setting. Now, here's the thing. Some people get stuck here. And they can be real jerks. Have you ever met a Christian that knows all the right stuff, but they're a total jerk and you don't sense any love in them? I was doing a men's event a few, uh, about two years ago. And we were doing this hike before the event. And this guy was talking about all these verses that talk about why women should submit to men. And I'm like, all right. And he's like, well, the Bible says women submit to men. Women shouldn't even talk in church and blah, blah. And he's like, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is an interesting cat. So we're sitting in this small group. And he's telling me, he's like, yeah, well, my wife said, if I don't come back from this event, a changed man, she's going to leave me because I'm spending too much time at work. But she just needs to submit. <laughs> and I was like, I hope you like being single, bro. Because <laughs> all your Bible knowledge is not going to change anything. Because what she doesn't need right now is, is your knowledge of the Bible. What she needs is love. And you ain't showing any of it. Good. And some people, there's this verse. The Apostle Paul says this. I love the King James Version. He says, much knowledge puffeth up. And sometimes we get stuck in the knowledge phase and we get so arrogant because we know a bunch of, what's that, <laughs> what's that reference from uh, Nacho Libre? You think I don't know a buttload of crap about the Bible, right? <laughs> Anyways, that's pro totally inappropriate for church. But <laughs> like we know a, a, you know a lot of stuff about the Bible, right? But you get stuck there and there's some churches where you go to and you're like, man, these people know the Bible, but they are mean. Because they're not moving towards love. They got stuck here and they fell in love with knowledge. And there are a lot of good people that are stuck there. I was talking to a guy the other day. He's been saved for 20 years. Just went through a divorce. And I started talking about the next phase for him. I started talking about the next phase, which is self-control, which is recognizing, hey, there's a deeper part of you that you need to get in tune with. You've got a soul. And the Greek word suke is where we get our word psychology from. P-S-U-C-H-E. And, and, and that requires going a little bit deeper and looking at some uncomfortable parts of you. Yes. You know all the verses about why women shouldn't speak in church, but you can't stop looking at pornography. And all those verses aren't going to fix that. So what are you going to do about it? And most people go, well, I'll go back in and get more knowledge and live right. But there comes a point where you start to realize you can put in all the external restraints, but if there's something deep within you that needs to be healed, you're going to find a way to sin. And you, the only way for internal transformation, I went through an experience like this in, in China. I, I just started realizing, I'm like, why can't I get over my anger? And this counselor started telling me, she's like, you're never going to get over your anger by changing your externals. You've got to change what's going on inside of you. And she forced me to look a little bit deeper. And there comes a phase in your journey after you've got the knowledge where you've got to start looking a little bit deeper at your soul, which your soul is made up of your emotions, your desires, and your thoughts. And you can know everything about the Bible, but if your thought life is out of line, you're never going to grow towards love. And some people get stuck here because this is a really fun phase where you start learning about yourself. You start learning self-discipline. And some people get there like, I can do this. If I just read one more self-help book, I can have love and faith. And you're like, no, you're stuck there because this is a really fulfilling phase. Then we go to this next phase, which, which is endurance. A friend of mine, uh, he's an endurance athlete. And he said, when I hear the word endurance, I just think it means you love pain a little more than everyone else. <laughs> and the endurance phase can be a painful phase. Because what happens is during the endurance phase, the relationship with God shifts a little bit. And God gets a little bit quiet. And you know, God, early on in your walk, man, he loves to speak to you and you'll hear his voice and you'll hear it loud. And I'm telling you, man, if you're early in your faith, I would encourage you, pray big prayers, ask God for big things because he doesn't ask your faith to start big. He wants your faith. To, he says, all you need is to start with a mustard seed of faith. So some of you are like, man, I don't know. Can I trust God? And he's like, try me, try me, ask big stuff. And he'll oftentimes, in the early on in the faith, he'll do amazing things for you that are just mind-blowing. But as you walk in the faith, he wants to, you to come trust more his character than what he can do for you. And when we get to the endurance phase, it gets hard because usually what happens is we get disappointed by God. And he doesn't heal our grandma from cancer. Or he doesn't save the marriage. Or he doesn't save the financial situation. 
And we have to kind of wrestle with God and we go, what do I really believe about him? Some of you right here know exactly what I'm talking about because when you're in that phase, you start to go, do I even have faith anymore? And it's kind of like Peter. There's this moment in, when Jesus was teaching and he said, if you want to follow me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody's like, is this dude talking about cannibalism? Because we ain't going to follow a cannibal. And they all start leaving. And Jesus turns to Peter. He's like, you going to leave me too? And Peter's like, I don't know where else to go. You got the words of life. Like, I'm in too deep here. And when you get in this phase, if these phages have built, built correctly, when you get here, you go, gosh, I don't know what else to do. Like, I know Jesus is the way. I know this is the way. But I, God is nothing like I thought he was. And God gets really quiet. And it's like a teacher. When it comes time for the test, they sit quietly in the corner. And you're like, hey, hey, hey. And they're like, hmm. Take the test, pass the test, and God gets really quiet like that teacher. And, and, and I believe that's a sign of his confidence that he knows you've internalized what you've learned along the journey here. But he wants to shift your perspective, and he wants to show you that maybe God's not as much of a slot machine as you thought he was, and maybe it's really more about surrendering to his will. And maybe the God you've been worshiping was the God you created in your own image. But, and listen, I believe God's gracious. Really, in the beginning of the faith, I believe he says, test me, test me. Let me show you I'm faithful. But as you get further along in your walk, you're going to find maybe God doesn't come out with the outcomes you kind of expected. And this is what I call the cloud, right? Because from on here on out, certainty kind of goes out the door. And you kind of come into what St. John of the Cross called luminous darkness. And luminous darkness is where you go, I don't have any clue what God is doing. But I've seen his faithfulness all this way up the journey. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with him. And I'm going to, and, and you come to this point where you start to learn more by not understanding than you did by understanding. And you kind of release your illusions of being in control of the situation because really we're never ever really in control, but sometimes he lets us think we are because he's cool like that. But there comes a point where he's like, mm -mm, I'm in control here. And you have to be really comfortable with letting that go and saying, I don't know where you're leading me and I don't know why this went down this way, but I trust you're leading me. Then we come to godliness. This word is really simply reverence and humility. It's saying, you are God, I'm not. And I surrender to your will. I don't know what you're doing, but I surrender. And then the next phase, and I wouldn't claim I'm in anywhere, anywhere near this, but I've heard. <laughs> the next phase is brotherly affection, where we learn to love others as we love ourselves. And I don't think that means you love, you know, you, there's all sorts of interpretations of that, but I think love others as yourself means you love others with the same source that you've learned to love yourself, because it's really hard to love yourself, because you know you and I know me. But it's only through God's grace that we learn to love ourselves, because we love what Jesus has done in us. And it's his work within us. And it's that same grace we extend to others Can we realize, man, what he's done in me, I got to extend it to that screwed up person next to me because I was just that person too because there's a real awareness of I am just not all that I thought I was. So this is the journey. And I, and I don't think we ever get to agape until we get to heaven. I just don't think we can do it. I think we get glimpses of it, and, and which is my point here. The, thing, the only thing that will move you between stages is two gifts that God gives us. And one of them I don't think of as a gift. The tools God uses to lead us to greater faith, to lead us from one stage to the next, are great love and great suffering. I like this one. I don't like this one. Great love, you've experienced this. Someone just came in and just accepted you just where you were and said, man, we love you right where you are. And you're just like, wow. And your eyes awaken to a new level of awareness of who God is and his love flowing through people. And then great suffering, I, I describe suffering simply as this, being out of control. Some of you, your suffering is physical. You just cannot fix your physical situation, the health issue, whatever it is. Some of you, your suffering is financial. Some of it's relational. But what if this suffering that you're going through right now, this thing you're like, I just, I just want to get away from it. I just can't take this anymore. I want to give up. What if it's actually the tool God wants, he's giving you right now a gift saying, I want to take you to the next level in your faith. I want you to begin to depend more on me than on people. What if the suffering you're going through right now, the lack of control over a situation, the injustice you see, is God saying, hey, I want to use this to take you to the next level if you'll stick with me in this. Just hold on. Because that's what God uses to take us. And, and the wildest thing about it is, think about what is the image that we hold on to so strongly in our faith. The image we so strongly hold to in our faith is the perfect picture of love and suffering. A guy sacrificially giving his life on the cross, being tortured, being beaten, totally falsely accused. The only perfect guy that ever lived gets that kind of a treatment. A perfect guy that ever lived gets that treatment. 
abandoned, betrayed, left to hang on a cross. Great suffering and great love. And it's the cross that drives us to the next level in each phase of your life. So I don't know where you identified with where you are on the, on the journey. Maybe you're just starting this journey of faith out and you're trying to get your life in alignment. And you're saying, I'm not worthy. And Jesus is saying, you're not worthy, but, but I am and I'm gonna make you worthy. Maybe you need to come to realization of that. Maybe you're in the journey right now where you need to dive into the Bible and know more about God. Maybe you're here this morning and you know tons about God, but the risk you need to take is to step to the next level and start to look a little bit inside of you at some of those things you know you need to deal with, some of those addictions, some of those hang-ups that you're like, man, why can't I get over these? So my, my encouragement for you this, this year is this. If you want to experience greater things God has for you this year, you must be willing to open yourself up to love and suffering. I'm cool with this one, not cool with this one. Now, some of you I know aren't cool with this one because you've been hurt. I know there's a, I, even first service when I said this, a bunch of people came up to me afterwards and was like, you were talking to me. A lot of you have come here and you were hurt by the church. And to you, I say this, welcome to the club. <laughs> I've been hanging out here 45 years and I've never been hurt by anybody quite like I've been hurt by people in the church. Pagans treat me better than the church sometimes. But it's the weirdest thing right here in the middle of the church is what God uses to redeem us. It's kind of like being with family. Family members can really hurt you, but they're still family. So maybe you need to open yourself up to love and you've been hanging out in the back and you got some gifts this church needs, but the last time you used those gifts to that church, you got taken advantage of or you got abused. I would say maybe you need to open yourself up to the love that this church has. And, and here's the problem with it. You're gonna get hurt because we ain't perfect. You'll open yourself to love and you'll get hurt again. It'll happen. But each time, remember, your faith is growing if you stick to commitment to letting your faith grow into love. Each stage, you're going a little bit further in your walk of faith. Some of you need to commit to love. Maybe you've been hurt so bad by your last marriage. You're remarried now, but you have not given yourself fully to this marriage. Because you're like, man, last time I did that, whew, I got torn apart. So you're holding a little bit back. You're going, ah, I'm going to play it safe so I don't get hurt that much again. But I'm telling you this, you're never going to experience the fullness of what God wants to show in you about his love until you give yourself to this marriage. Fully open yourself to it. And some of you need to open yourself up to suffering. You know, the, the challenge is, there's this one verse where Jesus said it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Some people use that as if you're rich, you can't enter the kingdom of God. He's like, no, it's not that you can't enter the kingdom of God. It's just as hard. And here's why I think it's hard. Because when you've got money, you can buffer yourself from a certain amount of suffering. I had a cowboy once tell me, you know, the only difference between the rich and the poor? I said, what? And he goes, the rich get a longer rope to hang themselves with. That's true, man. Like, they make the same dumb mistakes we all do, but they got money to buffer themselves from the mistake. So they get into a car accident, and they can go rent another car or buy another car, right? And sometimes with money, we, we, build, we can build a protection around ourselves to keep us from facing any suffering, our own suffering or the suffering of others. But Jesus seems to indicate that there's a, a closeness to God that comes when you're in a vulnerable state. And you're like, man, if I'm vulnerable, I could, I could like get hurt here. Like I'm, I'm, I'm living on the ragged edge here by not having this buffer or protection around me. And Jesus is like, right. And that's right where you're going to experience the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the meek. He's like, when you're in a position of vulnerability, it's actually when you're closest to Christ. Because it's through that great suffering that he, he's allowed to transform you into who he intends you to be. So here's my encouragement for you guys this, this year. You have no idea there's no upper limit to what God wants to do in your life if you will surrender to his love and the love of those around you and to the suffering that's going to come this year. And just say, Lord, I don't know why you brought this into my life, but I'm going to trust that you are in the, you're in the path, you're on the, this is the path of the righteous. It looks dark right now, but I'm, it's going to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And man, I might have some conflict in my life. There may be some conversations I don't want to have. There may be some confrontation this year I don't want to have. There may be some things I have to sign that I don't want to sign. But I'm trusting that through this, the great thing that you're doing is you're awakening my spiritual mind, which is why Paul says this, we rejoice in our suffering. For we know that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly our faith is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>